people do that because they don't want to have that ownership. They don't want to be able to look at their wife and say, I love you, but you're not worth $28 a month. Oh, jeez. Oh, you know? Oh. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to episode eight of the Life Insurance Academy podcast. I'm your host, Austin Lopes Silvero, and I'm here with Chris Ball, Zach McElwain, and Roger Short. The LIA podcast takes you out of the classroom and into the conversations of top producing agents in life insurance sales, so you can level up your business. For cliff notes and resources, visit liapodcast.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Life Insure Acad for show updates. Thanks for joining us. Today, we are wrapping up our deep dive series on the five real reasons why people don't buy that we touched on in episodes three and four. Make sure to go back and listen to those past few episodes if you haven't already. But for those who have been with us, you know that in this episode, we're talking about affordability and how to overcome money-related objections. Now, guys, I've overheard many conversations that you've had with agents here in the office, and they generally start something like this. Well, I had a great sit with a client today, but in the end, they just couldn't afford it. Now, this seems to be a big barrier with new agents. Austin, if I've had a dollar for every time I've heard that story. Then you could help all the clients that, could affo- that couldn't afford it. Right, right. <laughs> no, but man, we, that is the most common thing. And I think it's, it's the easiest thing for the client to say. And it's the easiest thing for new agents to accept and believe and then that creates a problem in its own. In its own, but um, when you really think about it, you know that money objection. You know, it's it's crazy because I'll I'll ask more because I want to hear more about the story because my experience is I need to figure out if this is a true objection or not. And a lot of times in that story, be like, oh yeah, you know, they had to pay off a bill or they have two more payments on their car or they just had a, a plumbing issue that they had to get fixed and then they're going to want to start this plan later. Um, and my question is, okay, well, what price did you show them? Oh, we were looking at, you know, 25000 or we were looking at 30000 in coverage. And my initial thought is like, whoa, okay. And do they have anything in place right now? Oh, no, 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 but they're going to they're gonna wait to get it. And so in my mind... Is that really? Is yeah, that really yeah. a money issue? I do feel like it's uh, you know if this were um, an, an, an illustration, if you will, of like uh, it reminds me of like I, like the reading sci- rainbow <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the <laughs> sci-fi shows like activate shield. That's that's what happens. I mean, you ring the you knock on the door, you ring the doorbell, whatever. Activate shield. <laughs> the client comes to the door. Uh, you talk about why you're there. And then they uh, they say, "Well, I can't afford it." At, you know, they're saying, "Activate shields." Boom, the shields are on. <laughs> Has anybody ever told you that at the door? Activate shields. <laughs> <laughs> yes, with tin foil hats on. No. What was <laughs> the thing that Picard always said in Star Trek when they put up the, you know, the the uh, the shield around the activate shield? I don't no. know. I don't remember. <laughs> but or in like Wakanda. Lower the shields. I don't think that's what they said. I wish actually. it were that clear. <laughs> you know, standing at the door on the Black porch. Panther. I wish it were that clear, but uh, you start to to understand it's that clear. You know, mm-hmm. after a while, that that it is then it probably is the number one number one objection you get. Are, are they always saying, you know, we just can't afford it, or like what are some other money related objections that agents are hearing? That's a good question. Well, ultimately, money. We we all have to address money. This is obviously a purchase, so they're they're buying something, right? So they have to give up part with some of their money on a regular basis to to own this thing. We all go through this when everybody anybody's selling yeah. us anything. So, in these five real reasons why people don't buy, this may be a real issue. We have to get to the heart of that matter, but most times it's not the real issue. Like what? it's the last issue. The affordability is almost always the last issue. But if you surveyed a bunch of brand new agents or people who are the uninitiated and ask them why do you think what's the reason why people don't buy or what do you think you know if you had to give the top five reasons people would say affordability like they say that it's it's like one of the top things that comes to their mind they ain't got no money yeah that's what it's <laughs> it's but it's almost always the last reason well, i think it's definitely the objection you hear most often what? when you actually sit with the clients like um, not at the door not setting an appointment but actually in the home you get that 
most of the time. How do you hear it though? I think that is a good question. Like, like sometimes they say, I can't, if, if this is going to cost anything, then I can't afford it. Yeah. Or I thought it was free. Or yeah. Where yeah. Are some if, of the other ones? if this costs anything, or, you know, if this is, you know, we probably can't even afford this anyway. Probably they start can. shutting it down yeah. hard, you know. But uh, they say the same thing in like six or seven different ways. It just depends yeah. on, at, you know, what what process are you through? Are you at the very beginning when you just sat down and you're like, oh, Miss Jones, how long have you lived here? Oh, we can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that does happen. Or mm-hmm. it, is, this, is this free? Is this something, you know, that I have to pay for? Because if I have to pay a penny, I can't afford anything. And I've had many of those sits, and at the end of it, they're hugging me, crying, and they ended up wanting a you know a hundred and twenty dollar policy. But it's throughout the process of what they're looking for, and and then I think you even have some objections when you actually hear that at the door, Chris. I mean, and I know that's another podcast, but sometimes you come to the door and they knock and like, oh no no, is this something free? Because if it is, I can't afford it. And uh, you know, one of the really good responses there's oh well i'm just assuming you just wanted to see about what it was and, and how it worked and how much it costs right yep and that, well that's all i, mean, I do. one of the worst things that happens is when you maybe make an appointment because you're a mortgage protection lead you make an appointment and you go to the house and maybe you made the appointment with the the wife the spouse uh, and because she's the one who filled out the request and you say you know make sure you're both there when you get there he had no idea you were coming surprise for him, it's about, it's too much. It's too much. I mean, it's the only thing that's on his mind is this guy's trying to sell right. me something. I don't know why he's here. The shields are way up. It's mm-hmm. like Picard saying, shields way up. You yep. know, um, And so you run into a hard objection because he has no, uh, he was surprised. So it's, his expect- it's like, the, it's the easiest objection for them to give. No 100%. More. Yeah, like they're shutting down hard of spending any of their money because they have no value on why you're there or what this is even about. So that's one of the hardest ones to overcome. And, and likewise, in final expense, if you take your leads and you're, you just route them and you knock on a door, yeah, and the person who filled out the card is not the person that comes to the door but the spouse, oh, we're not interested. I mean, they'll yeah. shut you down hard. Is this free? No, no, we're not spending any money on anything, and yet... The spouse, the other person who's in the kitchen, is the one who actually filled it out. You're just trying to. What, what, You're hey, looking past. Oh, can, can you get? Can you get? You know. You and, literally <laughs> just described my client last week. Yeah. The moment I opened the door, I couldn't even tell him my name. How much is it? <laughs> we can't afford. It. But I mean, and the spouse was in the kitchen and this and that, and uh, you know, it just I had to <laughs> detour quick. How long have you had that Firebird? You know, just, <laughs> and I start talking about his car, and uh, you know, is that your grandchildren? It's exactly that plan? same same exact situation. Your shoes on tie. You know, and the craziest <laughs> thing is, is you know, people do that because they don't want to have that ownership. They don't want to be able to look at their wife and say, "I love you, but you're not worth twenty eight dollars." Oh, jeez! Oh, you know, <laughs> no. they don't want to say that, and they don't want to blame it on their right. finances, their money management skills, yep. their spending habits. As the guys tell me, can't afford it. He's lighting one cigarette up after another. You mm-hmm. know, um, and you can see all these different hobbies that he obviously puts money into, but it's the easiest thing because it it blames it on nobody but the dollar bill. And you know, it's interesting because uh, if you're what are the rules in a house on holidays and you know people are coming over it's you don't talk about religion and you don't talk about politics mm-hmm. and you don't talk about money money you don't talk mm-hmm. about it it's it's almost like a deeply personal understood um social rule or, or, or what are those rules called what are they called social, social norm- etiquette yeah social etiquette social norm I think and, we've pushed past the political one. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> Everybody's blown that up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Twitter has done that in. So that, forget that's that. That's over. That's over. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't think, I think people expect you to just accept it mm-hmm. as a as the statement. Oh, you can't afford it. Okay. I don't know why I'm here. I'm just going to go <laughs> find some other people who can't afford it too. <laughs> so then like what's really behind this? Value. Again, it comes back to that that word that we've talked about so much in this, uh, all the way through these five real reasons why people don't buy. Um, here's a famous quote. This is a this is a fifteen dollar quote. We okay. had a fifteen dollar question. This is a fifteen dollar okay. quote. Uh, Monroe, nineteen ninety nine. Where do they oh. send the check? Well, the questions are nineteen ninety nine. 
but the quotes are 15. Oh. So if you want to continue on with this podcast, so if you, if, yeah. <laughs> swipe up. Hey, swipe up. Yeah, so if you, if you want the quotes from Roger, they're $15. Wow. I'll put my link. If you want the questions from Zach, they're $19.99. More value. And I'm if trying you want to, the jokes to, from And then me, if you like, use Chris's link, you'll get one of Zach's questions for free. There you go. <laughs> yeah, as an affiliate. Um, in the absence of value, price is always an issue. In the absence of value, price is always an issue. Nothing is nothing is is cheap enough. Nothing is a low enough price when there's no value. You've heard Zach's story about the Porsche in the driveway, right? We brought that in again. They were looking <laughs> we tried it in every <laughs> right? You, you heard, but no price is is if there's no value, you 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 mean you can't give stuff away. I mean, you can try to give stuff away sometimes, and people are like I don't want that crap. Mm-hmm. And you, Austin, here's something to think about. This is our last deep dive, right? Mm-hmm. And it's money. How come we didn't put money first? Because it's it's that's the least real reason. And when I say real reason, yes, we get it most often. That's the one everybody says all the time. Oh, they couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford it. Couldn't afford it. You know, I, every one of my leads this week, nobody could afford anything. You know, but in reality, it's last because you have to have the trust. They'll say I can't afford it, but the real issue is they just re- didn't trust you, right? I couldn't afford it. Well, they didn't have any value on it, so they didn't think they needed it. And if they don't need it, then they don't want it. Or I can't afford it, but, you know, I just I really don't want to take care of my family. I haven't seen my kids in years. They're selfish. You know, they can go ahead and bury this. I've done enough for them when we were kids. Really, they don't care enough about their family, and they don't want it. They can go ahead and bury this. What, what are you referring to? There? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that meant. <laughs> this, like me, once yes, I'm done? So, yes, this, one, they one can go ahead and bury this. <laughs> this <laughs> yeah. You can yeah. bury oneself. And then, then the other thing <laughs> is... Zach, you really <laughs> heard it all. <laughs> hey, when we talked about it last oh, week, my right? Oh, or the one that we hear in stories a lot, they couldn't afford it. They have to pay for this, 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 and that, and then they'll be able to call me back, right. which mm-hmm. is clearly not a money issue. It's an urgency issue. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's 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 really identifying what is the real reason and not the reason they give you. And Correct. I would, and I would say some of these are... Uh, they're they're battling some mirages themselves. Like they they've heard on. I like that word mirage. Yeah, yeah. Well, they they've heard shields on, and mirages. Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> they've heard on the on the television that it's uh you know uh ten dollars a unit or it's one hundred twenty bucks for ten thousand dollars roughly. You know, or they but they only hear ten dollars as low as ten dollars oh, a month. One or the other. They've they, what. There are times you sit with people and they're like, "Well, I can't afford anything," and they think it's going to cost three hundred dollars a month. That's that's what they believe. Yeah, and it's they have never unpacked some of this stuff. And you know, sometimes I can't afford it means I don't want you to come in my house because I didn't clean it. I know that sounds really bizarre, but it's the truth. And some people are like, "You're a stranger. I don't want you to." So when you talk about trust, those are trust issues of yeah, knowing you know this guy who's standing standing on my porch or this guy who called or a guy or gal who called and set an appointment to come sit in my brand new home like I, I mailed something in i wasn't expecting them to come by i'll just you know activate shield i can't afford it done, done. yeah right, right now we're trying to pay so many things and this this yeah. is not on the top of our priority Correct. list so we just can't afford this right now but it was a conversation we can have later how many people say chris i don't want this because i don't trust you <laughs> nobody. <laughs> right? nobody have they said you know you know, I, Chris. Uh, to be honest, you know, my house just really isn't in the shape that I want. Company, you're, you know, I've never seen you. Didn't expect you, um, and you know, it's cold outside. We'll sit outside. No, no, that's <laughs> never they've thrown their that. wife under the bus or their husband <laughs> under the bus on that. They yeah. say my wife doesn't like people coming in because yes. you know we haven't cleaned up in a little while, so mm-hmm. she doesn't want anybody in the house. So no, you can't come over. We never hear that. We you know what we hear. <laughs> oh no, 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 we're not interested. We can't afford it. Mm-hmm. That's over here. So how do you go about like removing these barriers? Step one is to understand what they're really saying. That is the most important. And like you say, like if you're at the door and you can have some hints or clues that maybe they just haven't cleaned their house in a while and they're embarrassed from that, um, well, we were able to pivot and we were able to say, no problem, it's a beautiful day, we can just sit out here and this just takes a few minutes. So it had nothing to do with affordability, even though that's what they said. 
um, you know, and we're able to then continue on the sit and remove that barrier. It's almost like when they give you the affordability, you know, condition, you just need to go back to item one, which is what? Trust. Trust, right? And, and work, work through the sequencing again until you hit affordability, <laughs> back to trust. Yeah. And then once you've established enough trust, you can get to need. And once you get to need, yes. then you can get to their want. And once you get to the want, there's where you can raise the value, and the value gets elevated, and the affordability thing starts to disappear. Right. You know, it starts to and wisp the urgency away. Rises. Ur- urgency goes up. The affordability thing kind of wisps away, and it starts to dissipate. You don't hear it as much because now you're getting to a place where they see value in moving forward. So uh, it's almost like a loop. Until I'm glad you you're get saying to that. that. Yeah, because um, I think as a new agent, because I know I felt this, my idea when I knocked on a door in a final expense sale. Or even trying to do a, we'll, we'll say it this way, Roger, doing a, uh, setting an appointment with a mortgage protection sit. My first inclination was, I need to sell a policy. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So that means if I'm I knocking, have to make money today. Right. So if I'm knocking on the door, if I'm on my door knock approach with a final expense sale, if that's my mentality, I'm trying to sell a policy while I'm knocking at the door. Or if I'm doing a mortgage protection call, I'm trying to get a policy while setting an appointment. And it, it's not that way. Like Roger said, it's a loop. It's do the first thing first. Do the first thing first. So the first thing when I do a door knock is to do a sit. That's it. The first thing when I call to set an appointment for a mortgage protection is to <laughs> set an appointment. Mm. That's it. There's nothing else attached to it. And if you're trying to set an appointment, the thing that you have to make them comfortable with is trusting you to do that. Correct. Mm -hmm. It's never about money. It's not about all the other stuff, about you selling a policy. It's just about making it easy for them to say yes to your appointment or making them easy for them to say, come on in, let's talk about this. Yeah, that's all. That's all. Uh, Or opening the door when you go get your stuff. Mm -hmm. You're just establishing enough. And so it goes back. That's the win. Yeah, it goes back to the loop. It's like a loop. I think a lot of people are expecting, especially new people, and I did myself because I didn't know any better, and I would say we all have, is we're going to the door, we're calling to set appointment, and we almost have false expectations. We're expecting them to say, hey, come on in. Oh, you're the insurance you know, man. Ooh, I've been waiting for you. I've been needing some coverage. You Come on in, sit down right here. Uh, how much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take? Do you need a voided check? You know, <laughs> and when that doesn't happen... We at first we expect, oh, well, everything they say is telling the truth. If they say they have coverage, then they must have the best coverage possibly can get. If they say they can't afford it, they probably really cannot afford this at all. And understanding that through experience um, and uh, you know learning the hard way, you you can actually see that that is not the case, and then that does not happen very often at all. Um, and if you believe that literally, Everything we do and everybody we serve, we're, you know, we're waiting for that one person just to come on in. And, you know, I've been wanting some insurance really, really bad. Um, You know, you're going to be waiting a long time. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what they think is affordable or unaffordable. We have no idea. But educating them on the different types of coverages or what they see every day in their mail mailbox or on the TV commercials, that's going to develop another level of trust and credibility, which is different than the relationship trust. Um, and then sliding in and, and digging and finding that need. If you notice, we're going through the five real reasons, right? So that we keep going back through them. <laughs> you, you, you wouldn't believe how important these are in understanding them. But finding that real need and what it's going to cover and why it's important to them to cover that um, and how important that relationship is with their family, um, that's going to translate into their want. Um, making sure we establish urgency of making sure we're taken care of. The very last thing we do is talk about money. But even like you said, now I can answer your question, but as you said about, oh, they say I, might, uh, I'm, I'm, I can't afford it or this or that, this can still be another objection. But at this point, in the presentation, it doesn't mean a um, my house isn't the clean the cleanest, and I'm at the door. Or it doesn't mean in the very beginning of the sit that I don't trust you, but I'm saying I can't afford it. Now, when they say I can't afford it here, 
that could simply mean I can't pay you today. I don't get my money right. till the third. Okay. Or, yeah, know, that's a really good point. Like sometimes people will bring it up early. And mm-hmm. so, you know, to Zach's point, like we address it at the end. But if they bring it up early, you do have to address it. Because they might say, like, I can't pay anything today. Or, you know, is this going to cost me some money today? Or I don't have any money right now. Like, I don't know why we're doing this. And you may need to address something. And your answer could simply be, oh, you definitely don't need to pay any money today. Right now, we're just having a conversation about getting you this information. We can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that later. So you do need to address it and settle their concerns so you can move on, build the trust, build the value, you know, get get their want, get their need, uh, and and move through that before you get to price. When I started, I was it was uh, my inclination to move forward, and I would uh, completely ignore the question. (laughs) <laughs> so they would say, uh, you know, how much is, or I can't, I can't afford this. Uh, so uh, tell me about your dog or, you know, something yeah. like that. I, I would just continue moving on, just mm-hmm. hoping something would, you know, I'd be able to finish and close. Um, but started to learn the importance of ad- addressing and being able to to say, Mrs. Smith, we'll get to that in just a moment. I know that's important to you. Um, now let me ask you a couple questions. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a yeah, and and you can tell step. like your confidence in doing that in your control in the home is crucial to there. But what I've noticed with myself is going, you know, being an agent and, and gaining experience and confidence in in this process is the more emphasis you put on addressing the trust need want urgency and then money, you, you rarely ever get a money objection if you're establishing those. The moment you skip one of them. Like I said, you're automatically going to get that objection, but that's not the real reason. It's because you didn't spend enough time building trust with the client. Um, So the cool thing is that this is a process, and the solution to it is to do all of the other things, and it never becomes an issue of money. But that doesn't mean you need to address money. You're just not going to get an objection of money. Mm -hmm. So if you are addressing money, right? you've built the trust, you've gone through the other ones, at some point, you do have to find the money in the house. You know, where where are some places that an agent can look? What are old cereal boxes in coffee cans? <laughs> <laughs> now, this is where you have to dive in and start discussing budget with them. Can you discuss budget with yeah, them? Yeah, yes, you can. I, I think you need to. If you don't, you're not doing your job. Um, and that that's only going to come though after you. Again, establish number one and number two, you know, and, and you're starting to move through the, the cycle of established trust. People don't want to start talking to you about their budget as soon as you sit down. You know, they're not going to say, Well, come in, what's this about again? Well, first of all, before we talk about anything, how much money do you make every month and do you have a <laughs> bank account? Like that's, mm-hmm. that's over, right? Out the door. So you have to establish that trust. And once you get into talking about their needs as a family, you can talk about, you know, are you retired? Are, you know, are you on Social Security? Do you have uh, any pension benefits? You know, tell me about that. Uh, tell me about what other insurances you might have. You know, what other benefits you might have in place? Do you have any benefits from work when you before you retired? You know, that you took with you after you retired. Um, and so you're kind of getting an overall picture, financial picture of their situation. So you can dive in and start talking about that, but it's in a progression. And so you're you're finding out. You're doing fact finding now. Uh, that you've kind of gone through the, the the trust establishing or trust building phase, establishing some need and want, and now you're getting into their situation and say, well, let's find out how we can best help you and maybe help you solve some of these problems. So Roger's saying that as a, as an expert, and Austin, I know you have written seven hundred thousand dollars in premium in two months i think is that right <laughs> yeah, yeah. Already, man you crushing it <laughs> nah, but um so you haven't you haven't filled out an application yet so when you hear roger talk about going over budgets with people that you've either sent an appointment with or knocked on a door what do you think as a new agent what are they processing what are they thinking uh, like, as they hear this i'm thinking I'm trying to get my significant other to go through a budget and you're going <laughs> through this budget with people you just met like <laughs> I mean, A, that's got to be difficult, but I also know there's a lot that goes into a budget, right? There's a lot of factors and and trying to think of all those components without spooking people, I think. Mm -hmm. And so, like, how do you ride that line? I think the, the one thing, you can't have, you have to have the right mindset going into this. 
you can't have the mindset, and a lot of new agents do, where I'm going to sell on a policy. I need to find extra money in their budget for them to afford another policy. You know, having the mindset that you're there just trying to assess everything and find the right need for the family and then take care of that, when you are going through that budget, you will see things in there that the clients may not see at first. Can I say something about budget? Because I think people have different ideas about budget too. Like they think uh, maybe you're maybe you and your family have put together a budget and you're working off of that budget. But when we say doing a budget, what we're finding out is what they're spending their money on. In most mm-hmm. cases, they haven't done a budget. They're yeah. just money's just going out. That's mm-hmm. it, and they don't even know what it's going towards. Or if they the have a budget, it's shocking to them in a lot of cases. They're not sticking to that budget if they do Correct. have one. Yeah, yeah. And the picture is different if you're sitting with a mortgage protection client. Families that are in their 30s, 40s, are still working. You know, they have kids. That conversation is going to be a little bit more professional. It's going to be a little bit more, um, you know, fact finding, financial picture profile. And you're with some seniors who have been retired, maybe on Social Security or small pension or just Social Security. It's it's a very basic conversation. Say so, you know, in order bef- before we move forward too far, like uh, you're, we talked about your job. Um, do you have any pension from that? No. Do you, are you on Social Security? Great. When do you get yours? Is yours coming in on the third of the month or one of the Wednesdays? Now you're finding out information it, about money, right? All right. So that's so important, Roger. What you just said. I mean that. That's a little fifteen dollar thing right there. Ka-ching. I mean, that's a fifteen dollar. That was thing. a question, so that's nineteen ninety nine. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's <laughs> Those right. are nineteen. But you made it so effortless in there. The fact that uh, you 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 sound like you've done this a thousand times before, and you're assuming that you're just going to go ahead and have that conversation with them. Yeah, this is a normal part of the process. This is normal. Mm-hmm. This yeah. is what's going to happen when you meet with someone like me. <laughs> right. And now, talk about how we can help your family. Yeah. I need to know some things so and, that we can make a recommendation. And you know how Social Security is paid. And when they hear that, they're like, oh, this guy knows something about how I receive my income. I guess he's done this before. Yeah, right. the fact that you can say, like, Austin, you might not have known. that. Social, yeah. I think we just had this conversation yesterday. Mm-hmm. Like Social Security is either paid out on the third. of No, it was actually with one of our agents. It's paid out on the third of the month or on one of the Wednesdays, the second, third, or fourth Wednesday. If you're on a supplemental Social Security benefit, you get that on the first of the month. Like these are things that are common amongst the people that we're sitting with. So you as an agent, when you say, you know, you're receiving Social Security benefits, great. Do you get yours on the third or one of the third of the month or one of the Wednesdays? It gives them confidence, like Chris said, that you know what you're talking about. So they say, I get mine on the third Wednesday. Well, how much is that? That's the follow-up question. Mm-hmm. It's twelve hundred and sixty. All right, and and Mary, what about you? Are you receiving a Social Security benefit as well? Yes. And are are you on a third or one of the Wednesdays? I'm on the third Wednesday also, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And how much is yours? Mine is nine hundred and fifty. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. So you're making about twenty one hundred dollars between the two of you. Is that right? You know, you just do the math in your head. And so now you're having a conversation. Now you have an idea, a, fit, a, a picture, a financial profile of what their situation is. And you know, you're going to talk a little bit now about their um, their expenses. How much is going out? You know, do you own this house? Do you rent? You know, what other financial obligations do you have? Um, if something were to happen to to Tom. You know, how much would you be responsible for monthly? Can you cover that with your payment? Do you know what's going to happen when one of you passes away? You get to keep the higher of the two Social Security benefits if you're still living together and married. Um, you, but you give up the smaller one. Mm-hmm. Like, are, were you aware of that? Well, no, I thought I got half of his. Or sometimes people don't know what happens because they've not experienced it or know anybody who's experienced it. So you're educating, you're building trust, you're finding out about their financial profile and picture, and you're creating an opportunity where money is not going to be an objection because you're going to take that profile, their situation, their scenario, and then fit a recommendation to their needs. And I think important part to remember is, like we said earlier, is we've gone through the other four real reasons, right? Mm-hmm. Like we've built the want and the need. At this point when we're talking about affordability and having these conversations about budget, like it's assumed that we're at a point where they they have expressed that they want it and you're just helping them figure out how to get it versus having the affordability conversation early and you're trying to, okay, I know we have this number to work with and then 
creating the sale, like you said, from there. Like it, it, it's flipped. So mm-hmm. I think context is important, especially if people are listening to this episode before any of our others. Is yeah, you know, you're coming into this affordability discussion later down the road. They already want it. They have some urgency because you've developed the value, and so now you're sitting next to them. You're helping them figure out how we can make that happen. And, and like Zach said earlier, is it's not from my understanding of what we talked about today is like, it's not, okay, where's the extra money that we can squeeze through for this policy? It's, Hey, you, we know you want this. So let's add this to your budget and see what, um, where we're spending the extra money and where we can help you, you know, in the future. Yeah. I think the important thing is just like you said there, Austin, um, when you're going through those and you have trust, need, want and urgency, it money is not an issue, and you can tell if it's a real reason or not. It's almost never, maybe three percent of the time, a real issue. Because if if you're thinking about this, and I've had a real client where I've set into a home, and we went through the entire thing, and we got down to budget, we went through it, and for you know her, she was upside down each month, and she just broke out crying to me. And she's like, I really want to make sure this is taken care of for my daughter. I love her so much. You know, she wouldn't have, you know, the means to be able to take care of this. And she's in tears, but she's spending more money a month than she brings in. So my next thing is to start thinking, how can I help her? Because yes, Mm -hmm. her issue, her objection, her true objection is I can't afford it, but I believe it because she's begging me for help on how to do that. That's the difference because she really, really wants it, right? Mm -hmm. So we were able to bring both of her daughters in on the sit. Okay, they just happened to be in the home as well, um, and they, she, the mother is still supporting um, her two daughters. Her daughters have a little part-time jobs; they bring in a little bit of income. And I asked her how she makes ends meet, and with them there, and each of them give her mother a little bit of money each month to cover the rest of the bills. Mm-hmm. So what we were able to do is establish that trust with the daughters kind of go through the process with them, let them understand the value that, hey, if your mom passes away, this is going to fall on you guys to pay for this and that. And if they're already helping her uh, each month pay her bills, then they're more than willing to help pay a little bit more just to get something in place, not to make them rich because they're not going to be willing to put $200 in a plan for their mother when they're all trying to make ends meet, but they're going to put enough in place to be able to take care of the, at least a cremation, so there's not there's nothing that falls down on them, and to see that it, it was a beautiful set, you know, to be able to see the family come together in a situation where money was rarely, but money was the real reason, and then we were able to find a solution yeah. and solve that. It's it's sad when agents go in with the idea, like Chris was talking about earlier. I want to make a sale. They don't acknowledge that they get the client to buy something that they can't afford anyway. Mm-hmm. Like we see those things happen. Those policies go in force and, you know, 60 days later it lapses or it cancels because the payment, the second very second payment was missed because they, they just couldn't afford it. Mm-hmm. Um, but a, an agent who was in there with not, you know, who didn't have the client's best interest was pushing, pushing product to make sales. And uh, unfortunately, if you're in there to make a sale and you're not in there to help the client, what's going to happen is, You'll you'll try to ram through the affordability objection even when they're real, mm. and it's not the way to go. You need to do the right thing for the client. And I think there's ways to help uh, help people. And mm. I I really liked what you said, Austin. For a guy who doesn't know what the heck he's doing, you're crushing it. I'm learning. But you know, you <laughs> said you you sit next to him. I mean, that's really the idea. You're sitting next to them, and you know, you might be scratching your head for a minute, but you're trying to help them find a solution. And there are solutions. You know, I recently um, personally got a vehicle and uh, I called my insurance company to try and figure out, you know, what my insurance costs were going to be. And um, they said, well, hey, you're you're due for a review on your, your policy. And I said, what are you talking about? And they said, yeah, every three years you can have this discussion. I'm using quote fingers. And uh, so they transferred me over and I found out that I was able to save about one hundred and fifty dollars a month on my car insurance. And switching to Geico <laughs> <laughs> without making any changes, and it's fifteen percent. Uh, 
Yeah, it's it's nuts. It's nuts that you know. And I said, well, wait, can I make this retroactive because it's been a year? I didn't realize, you know. And they said, no, of course not. <laughs> but anyway, um, a lot that's of when you say, okay, I'm going to price shop this. <laughs> yeah, but, but but that's a good point, Roger. That our seniors don't know this stuff. Like they're just yeah. paying rates. Like mm-hmm. they're paying two hundred dollars for a cable and like high you're, speed you're internet. They're their advocate to go Correct. through what they're currently spending to see where you can help out. Yeah, yeah. They're and paying just for a home phone, things. high speed internet, and all the cable channels. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times they don't use the internet and they don't have a home phone i tell you that that is that is one of the biggest things i see in people's budgets you know that we're trying to find a way to pay even 20 30 50 dollars a month for a plan to take care of their loved ones and they're paying 189 dollars on tv that they only watch one channel and a lot of that is because these cable companies are the only one in their area so there's no competition and they can literally charge anything they want and um, increase the rates. Yeah, you... and so I've spent many times just calling the companies and telling, hey, you know, um, you know, with the client, and you know, hey, she's on fixed income, she's on disability, she has low income, she only makes this much. This is not going to work. And you wouldn't believe of the new promotions they have out or the discounts <laughs> they're able to do for low income because at the end of the day, they don't want to lose a customer, um, and that's easy money for the. Um, the cable companies, and you you would be surprised. You're able to drop their bill by 80 to to $100 right there. Mm-hmm. Um, so Put me through to the retention department, please. There you go. Right, and, mm-hmm. and it's amazing, and that's just going an extra step. And, and, and that's just one bill. <laughs> that's just one bill. And then you see other things where um, I've sat with clients that, like I said, have wanted it and needed it because all that's important. You have to have that first. And then we realize they're spending two hundred and thirty dollars a month on cigarettes. Well, if we just cut down on five cigarettes a day, blah 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 blah, it's going to end up saving a hundred dollars a month for that client in just cigarettes. Um, or finding out they do have another life insurance policy that they may have recently got, and it may be a policy that has them in a, a qualification or they got it through the mail, internet, or TV, and they can qualify for something much better at a much lower rate. And you're able to see then, hey, we're able to get the same amount of coverage you have at a lot lower rate. So in fact, going into the home with the mindset of, hey, hopefully this client can afford extra money or I want to sell them a policy. In fact, we're leaving the home. They have more or better coverage and they're paying less than when I showed up. Mm -hmm. So now they have more affordability for other things or take their grandkids to the movies or to have more expendable income and they have coverage because I showed up. So mm-hmm. it's not always I'm coming in, sell you a policy, you're going to be paying more, your budget's going to be tighter. And there are folks who have loans they're paying off, debts they pay off, they have policies that they've um, forgotten Borrow, about. That or they borrowed could, money on. Or borrowed money on. And they are they don't realize they may be eligible for uh coverage at the same price, maybe a little higher, but at the same time, they could pay off those loans that they were looking to to pay off and free up some money and some interest payments that they're paying on things. So yeah, there's it, it is our job to help them find solutions to their money. When you talk about finding solutions to their money, um, one thing that I've seen like in our help channel on Slack is a new agent posts, hey, like they um, get social security, but it's Direct Express, what can I do? A, what does that mean? And B, <laughs> what can they do? Like that, I, that's a money related issue, I assume. I mean, I hear Social Se- Security, so, that's money. Yeah. So, seniors, um, when you retire, you can start qualifying for Social Security benefits if you've paid in, obviously. Um, and I think you can start drawing that at age 62. You can, you can get a, a higher benefit if you wait to age 67. It was raised a few years ago from 65 to 67. So there's kind of a staggering, like if you, the, the longer you wait up to age 67, the, the, the more you'll get or you'll get your full benefit. Um, in some areas in the country, if it's rural or they don't have a lot of access to banking, sometimes it's difficult for them to get to a bank. So the government, Social Security, has to have a way to pay clients, has, has a way to pay people who are Social Security recipients. So sometimes they put it on, they've worked out a deal with MasterCard and, and they've created this product called Direct Express. And they deposit their money on like a prepaid credit card or debit card once a month, and there's their Social Security deposit. It's on a card that they can go to the store or gas station and use as a, as a card. Sometimes people don't have a bank account, maybe because they've had a poor banking history. 
Mm-hmm. Maybe they've bounced checks and they've had a bank account, but now it's closed. Well, because they don't have one, they still need a way to receive their Social Security benefits. So again, they receive it this way. A lot of insurance carriers won't even accept that type of payment. And, and that's why we're seeing those questions. Yeah, yeah. So because carriers won't, ex- a lot of carriers won't accept that type of payment, typically what's happening there is that client, that profile of a client has a low persistency rating with carriers who've tried to implement payment plans of that type. So those, those types of policies are, have a higher tendency to lapse for non-payment than someone who has an automatic bank payment, like an ACH payment through the bank. Mm. Um, and so it's, you're limited in the carriers that you can write. So it's important to have a good selection of carriers that you can use in those situations. And I think this probably will become more common, guys, you know, as time goes on, the way that banking is done and the way that money is done. And I mean, you know, everybody's familiar with Venmo and Cash App and all these other ways now you can move around money, right? And the cryptocurrency, who knows where that's going to go. But uh, Chris seems to know. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, so the accessing money in different ways other than tr- through a traditional bank, I think will change over time. However, right now it's an issue, so we have to address it. When, if, if, if they don't have a bank account, that is a barrier sometimes. So, so it's not always affordability, it's how they're going to pay. Right. Mm-hmm. So then you need to find a carrier that will take that form of payment, or you need to find someone else in the home. Who maybe is the beneficiary, you know, direct benefit of this bene- of this uh, policy that will maybe the payer, right? Zach, I'm sure you've run into situations like that. Oh, always. And you know, my main the first thing I want to do is do what's best for the client, put the client first. And like you said, when they are on a direct express card, sometimes your carrier options are limited, and sometimes they don't put the client in the best situation. So. The first thing is to look for a family member, a spouse, a child, um, you know, whoever that beneficiary is, who's going to be impacted the most because they're going to have a reason to want to do this and help their family. Um, So let's see if we're able to um, make them the payer so they pay for this policy. Um, Another option would be to set it up um, quarterly, semi-annually or annually or with some carrier options that we have um, monthly as a direct bill so the client is actually able to go to their local gas station or convenience store and get a money order um, so they can take their direct express card buy a money order and mail it and send it into their companies that would be an also that's also a a way that um, most companies will take payment Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it doesn't limit our options but if we absolute have to then we will still be able to take care of the client with um being able you know, to provide them coverage with the direct express card. In this business, we've always said, you know, when you're in life sales business, it has to benefit three people. There's three, there's, there's three uh, uh, people that, that need to have an interest. Number one, right. the client. Stakeholders. Yeah, client, the insurance company, and the agent. So it can't just benefit two of those because mm-hmm. the third one, something's going to happen. So a lot of companies don't accept that type of payment because of the persistency. So you as an agent, you also need to be aware that this has a lower persistency. So when Zach says trying to find someone else who is a stakeholder in this relationship to be the payer, that's a way of not only preserving the benefit for that family and giving it a higher probability of a higher persistency rating of staying in force until that family needs protecting it. Protecting them, yeah. But it's also a way to protect your own your own commission for the work that you're doing. So uh, because after all, we are in sales to make money, right? Mm-hmm. And we're talking about those three facets. So you need to you need to work to find solutions that fit the carrier, the client, and you. So um, finding an alternate payer is a great option. Is probably the best option first to look to before you automatically just default to the carrier that accepts Direct Express. And yeah. I mean, it sounds like it is important to have carriers that accept our. Express. Yes, but I mean, some agents will just say, I don't creative. want any of that business okay. because they're in it for themselves only mm-hmm. or they have a very low interest in caring for clients after the initial sale. And they're like, nope, I don't want any of that business. If they don't have a bank account, I'm out of there. Mm-hmm. Well, there's real people and there's legitimate families and re- real families that have real needs and can pay, mm-hmm. right? You just need to work a little bit harder. So I'm sorry that it takes a little bit more work 
but yeah. hey, but the need is still there. We're, the we're in a we're we're in a, a financial services and a caring business, so l- let's at least care, okay? Right. And you if know, you don't care, you're not going to be in the business very long anyway. No, I had um, this one is a close to home issue for me. I had a client I sat with in the mountains of Kentucky, a wonderful lady, and she did not have a bank account. And uh, had a great sit with her. There was a lot of desire and need. Her daughter was a nurse. Uh, she was working. And her mom wanted me to call her daughter and see if we could set it up through her bank account, which was an awkward conversation over the phone. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't going to be back in that area. And my day was full. Had the conversation with the daughter over the phone, showed her how she could find me online through the state website. Reluctantly gave me the payment information. So we set up the policy. It was a $10,000 policy. And six months later, I got a call from a funeral home. And uh, the woman, her sister, and their pregnant niece were killed by drunk drivers. Six months into the life of the policy. And the daughter, I spoke to her several times about that policy and how important it was to her. And it paid out. So that that was an important set. And I I mean, Mm -hmm. I could have said, this is too much work. Yeah, I could have or, said that. No, I'm not interested. You don't have a bank account. This is going to go south. <laughs> yes. I'm going to lose my commission. Right. That's just sad. Or even like a new agent fearing that conversation with the daughter that as soon as you pick up the phone that you're thinking, oh, well, mom, don't do anything. You don't need him. You don't know him. You don't trust him. He's not there for you. Um, and that's all the care that you had with that client and not scared to be able to talk to that that mom. Because at the end of the day, and I tell everybody, we are advocates for that beneficiary. 100%. We are the only one in that home that is caring about that daughter's life once the mother's gone. And a lot of times, some of that barrier we have to overcome is that daughter. But you're doing it for the right reasons. And as long as they see that and you mm-hmm. can communicate that, it really will affect that persistency, as Roger was talking about, because now you have two people on board. So if the mom has a flat tire in her car or has a water pipe burst, guess who's going to step up and make sure that's taken care of? Mm-hmm. That person, that mm-hmm. beneficiary. Are there any other like last thoughts or ideas around affordability as we kind of wrap up for the day? I think probably the only last piece that I can think about is, um, you know, when you're setting up a payment, especially for seniors in, in, in the final expense space, you need to align payments with their Social Security pay date. And typically they're not going to have a bunch of money to make the first payment now. And that's okay. Um, you know, if they're going to get their receive their benefit on the third of the month, so we're going to go ahead and complete this application. Once it's approved, we'll be notified. And once your first payment is processed on the third of March, if this is February, your policy will be in force. But that's that aligns exactly with your Social Security pay date. We'll set it up that way, so you never have to worry about that. So you don't have to make any payments today. We'll set this up. We just need to know if this is an affordable amount. And we're going to get into pricing in probably another episode, but. Finding the date and making them feel comfortable about when that payment is going to go out is also a money issue that needs to be addressed. Um, oftentimes, if you're sitting with a, a mortgage family or a term, you know, you're maybe with some term products or younger families, asking the question, is there a better date of the month for you to set up your payment uh, than another? Or do you want this to go in force right away? Um, you know, we can put it in force right away and then we can set up the recurring payments on, you know, the date of your choice. Well, yeah, the 15th of the month will be better because that's when, you know, we pay our, you know, we do all these other payments on the 1st and the 15th is, is, is the next great time to do that. Again, that's addressing money concerns, money issues, but again, it's setting the client at ease so you can move forward. One comment on that, Roger, like the important thing is, is to also understand. So if you know your client is getting SSI on the 1st mm-hmm. and they're saying, just go ahead and make this the 5th, like <laughs> we have to, we have to understand and, you know, we've established that trust and that connection to the client to tell her, you know, you know, you know, Miss Jones, this is going to be better for us to set it up on the first. That way we know it's there. And the most important thing you're taking care of is going to be paid because this is the only bill you'll ever have in your life that's actually going to pay back to your family. And being able to almost, you know, um, help her understand and see that because a lot of times agents would be like, okay, no problem. We'll set up on the 5th or the 7th. And then all of a sudden the client gets their money. They pay their bills. They buy this or that. Christmas rolls around. Flat tire rolls around. And boom, there's no money left. And you get an insufficient funds. Yeah, so helping them structure when they pay and why uh, removes some of the concern uh, of the, the financial issues. The, the, um, the one final wrap-up thought, I guess, would be 
uh, when, and we're going to, again, address some of this once we get to pricing strategies, is making, giving them options and not overselling clients. There's a difference between upselling, and we're going to talk about that, versus overselling. So as an agent, make sure once you understand their affordability and you understand the financial profile of that home, you're not trying to pull as much premium out of there because you're a closer and you watch all these podcasts and video, YouTube videos on closers and you're trying to pull as much premium as you can out of that home. Yeah, you don't want to be the issue of affordability for yourself. Yeah, you don't want to make, you don't want to make money the real affordability issue. Find something that's affordable. Give them the option. Give them two or three, three choices is really the best way to go and, and let them decide so that it fits in their budget and then remove the other barriers and move forward. So uh, sometimes you need to undersell, uh, you know, and, and because they might, they might want to pick something that's higher. You know, mm-hmm. well, I want this benefit. Well, based on your budget and everything you told me, let's start with this first. See mm-hmm. how that goes. We can always revisit because I know that you'll be able to afford this one and this will cover the basic needs. So it's my recommendation maybe that we consider this, this other option. And so you're going to get into some of that, but again, not overselling, not making it about you, making it about them, finding that solution, removing the barriers, making it easy for them to move forward. Yeah, and I have a final thought. It's more on all of the five real reasons because I know we're wrapping this up here. And if you're a new agent in the car or if you have some experience under your belt, um, you know when you get an objection... Understand what the true objection is behind that. Understand the real reason why somebody didn't buy, and you will start to realize that it's not money, and it may be want. It may be urgency. Regardless of what they tell you, if you can identify the true, real reason, then you have then you know where you can make the necessary adjustments. That way you can continuously to get better so you can serve your clients the right way. Well, that's a wrap for this episode, and the entire five year reasons why people don't buy series. Thanks so much for listening to the Life Insurance Academy podcast. For cliff notes, resources, and more, visit liapodcast.org slash EP8. That's liapodcast.org slash EP number eight. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. Give us a five-star rating and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Life Insure Acad. The Life Insurance Academy podcast is hosted, edited, and mixed by me, Austin Lopesavero. This episode was produced by Roger Short and myself. Our theme song is by Flashing Lights. Next week, we're starting a new monthly segment on the first Wednesday of every month where we'll actually be covering a topic that you are wanting to learn about or are currently struggling with. So visit liapodcast.org slash help and submit your topic idea. We'll pick one of those ideas and dive into it next week. We can't wait to hear from you. We'll catch you on another episode. Drive safely and go be a difference maker.